Here's a question for you. Why do we love to hate Richard Meal watches? Open-ended, simple enough to understand. Is it because their designs are quite polarizing? Is it because of their prices, the gray market? Is it because of the people that they are affiliated to? All of that will be discussed and more. I've made a whole list of bullet points that we can run through, but I also want to talk about the design in more detail, the strategy behind the brand and the identity of the brand. And I hope this will generate some kind of conversation that we can all play a part in. Try and understand each other a little bit more. Because as a community, I think, collectively, we all have a similar feeling about these watches, what they represent. And let's be honest, collectively, they are not for us. Now, there is no doubt that Richard Mille is a groundbreaking watchmaker. No one can deny that. The movements he has developed over the last 20 years, the use of technology that he puts into these pieces ever since their inception until now is incredible. The things he has been able to do with these pieces, the boundaries that have been pushed because of the innovations that have gone into them, something that many watchmakers haven't gotten close to. Now, we are very quick to judge a watch on its aesthetics, by its looks, the way it portrays itself in the first place. We criticize it because it looks funny, but I don't think Richard Mille gets enough credit for the movement making that goes into these pieces. So that's a big positive to take away before the video even starts. But the strategy behind the brand name, let's try and unpack that a little bit more. When the RM01 Tourbillon was unveiled at Basel World in 2001, it was marketed and presented as a ultra, excuse me, a hyper luxury watch. No idea what that means. Basically, it allows you to put extra zeros behind the price tag. Even then, when this watch was debuted, it was going for more money than any of the high-end tourbillon makers that were unveiling at the show too, like Patek Philippe and other names. They were limited to something like 17 pieces, and through the news media and the outlets, they all pretty much said the same thing unanimously, that we were going into a different phase of watchmaking, that Richard Mille had done something that no one else had ever tried before. The simple strategy behind the brand itself was to appeal to the 1%, those who want to be in their own niche, the one area in watch collecting where no other can really follow. And we could say that this whole strategy in part has been the reason why we are seeing so many of these more commonly assigned luxury brands are going in the same direction. This maker who focuses on bespoke pieces advertising to the millionaires basically got them to back the brand. And that is something else to pay attention to. Whoever you are as an individual, if you can get people to back you and your product, you're in good shape. Richard Mille has been able to do that by the way he has connected to his clientele. And at least that is how the relationship first began. It possesses all of the hallmarks of a successful brand. You see one Richard Mille piece, you've pretty much seen them all. They are easily recognizable, distinctive, holds to the values that they try to establish like this futuristic outlook. A watch design, its face, that is pretty illegible, but we will talk about that later. If we are to talk about the design of these watches, what I find incredible is how the identity of the watch has taken shape through the traditional Tonneau style case. A case shape that was very popular around the 20s and the 30s died out until we would say the 90s when they started getting re-established. Makers like Frank Muller and others try to re-establish this aesthetic. Every model in the Richard Mille lineup focuses on the retro-futuristic identity, and I put that in quotations. For those of us who know watches and their aesthetics, we can easily identify it as a tonneau-shaped case. We notice very often how the crown has been integrated into the cases. They have this onion style, very Flieger-esque. Also something inspired by the 20s and the 30s, that kind of knurling. Of course, what makes these parts and shapes very different is that they are formed from different materials. We are talking aircraft-grade aluminium, titanium, forged carbon, carbon fiber, other fancy materials. I'm sure palladium is thrown in there somewhere. We see gold, 18 karat gold, many others. So where this watch defines itself in the future segment is it's using these alternative materials as well as different strap options. And then we get to the dials of the watches that all look relatively the same because most of them are skeletonized. What this does then is give off the impression of a high performance sports car on the wrist. And that has been the established identity behind the brand. The focus on being forward when it comes to technology, actually sharing the raw material on the surface for people to enjoy. This is something that the designer and me can get behind. I like the fact that everything is exposed. The issue is that it sacrifices things like legibility on the dials in favor of this technology. The counter argument is that you're spending X amount of money to buy this watch. You don't need it to tell the time. And I don't like that argument very much. It does ruin the whole purpose of the watch and its function. Getting more into the design of the watch, the inspirations behind a lot of these pieces, pretty fascinating. Partnerships with hypercar manufacturers, 
We see small motifs shared in places that makes it a bit more distinguishable. Often we see a use of contrasting colors that are in some way assigned to the car manufacturer too. Very often they go so far to use specific materials found on the motor vehicles in their watches. Also something quite commendable. So you can see where I'm going. As a design exercise, the process of development, how it's evolved, how it has thought through, how it is perceived and put on paper, is something that any creative person can get behind. Even though the end result can be hit or miss, it is inspiring to see the process and the build-up behind it. And then we move to the partnerships. This is also a part of its design identity and the strategy behind the name, the way these watches have been assigned to athletes, sports stars all over the world. Not only are these watches now on a world stage, they are now on the wrists of people who are seen by many others. Very often these athletes have fans, and so the fans can identify that the brand shares in a relationship with them. Therefore, they should, in a way, be obliged to appreciate the brand. It's distinctive, easily recognizable. On the wrists of notable figures, it's shared to a much wider community. The end result is that it's seen more and more often. News articles are written about them and people want what they can't have. So that, in a way, is the strategy and the design behind the watches. And that could be a main reason why we don't like them very much. But there are many more reasons. The first thing I point out, I ask, is it because their designs are actually quite amazing? To each their own. I can appreciate the design of the watch as this high performance machine. That has always been its intent. And I understand that. The way they are portrayed now, they don't feel like watches anymore. They barely work like watches anymore because they're so difficult to read. And in fact, the design of the watch is encroaching more on how the watch is perceived, the image, not so much the technology that goes into it. Another point why we love to hate the brand, is it because of the people who buy the watches? Not so much the people who are affiliated to them, like the sports stars, but those out there who want the watches because of their prices, because everyone else wants them. These people don't necessarily have an appreciation for horology. They maybe have an appreciation for the brand name. Like I said in the beginning, they like to back Richard Mille himself and the storytelling that comes with the watches. But the majority of people who buy these things want them for the image. They want them to show off to other people that they have them and no one else can get them. In many ways, it's a flex, as the millennials call it. And instead of actively getting into these watches because of the technology, because of the components that make up this thing, this high-functioning machine, they just want it because it looks cool and it's the hot thing. That's a big, I would say, major detractor that the Richard Mille name has established over time, especially over the last five years. The next point, do we dislike the image of the brand? Going back to the origins of this maker and the identity, the strategy behind these watches and who they're supposed to appeal to, is that something that is a complete turnoff to a lot of us? We don't want that association. And in fact, the design of these watches, as interesting as they are, retro-futuristic, they aren't that attractive, at least to the majority of us. The image of a brand is very important, how it is perceived by all of us. Not necessarily just the enthusiasts, but anyone who's interested in watches. Some manufacturers out there have created such a good image, such a great story and a narrative behind their product that they could package anything and people would want it. And over the years, Richard Meal pieces have been built up as this super performing sports watch that is incredibly durable, that can do anything, but also has this futuristic flair of being something cutting edge that can be worn on all occasions, but also has this identity that puts it above its competitors. It's very interesting. So the question we can add to that is, is it because they are successful that we love to hate the brand? As much as we do like to make fun of these watches at times, they do turn a tidy profit. And this is something I will get into later when we discuss the grey market, but just at retail, these pieces on average, I think very entry level start at 100,000. And that is just ludicrous to think. And I think I should add another section at the end about common sense. Hold on a second. As much as we do like to criticize the brand often, are they not pioneers in this area? They have done many things that other manufacturers haven't, and they still continue to push those boundaries. Being the first at doing something, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, does make you a pioneer in that area. So if we are to circle back to the watchmaking once again and the use of this technology and 
all the fancy materials and components, it does mean that they are pushing into these areas of how the watch is perceived differently. And in fact, looking at the direction of where the future of watch interest is going, if we're referring to smartwatches and how so many people who have never owned watches now want smartwatches to wear, this is another facet, another area where this brand could succeed. The use of this technology and how it is melding with the future focused idea. This one is a bit more cerebral. Do we love to hate the brand because they don't make sense to us? Maybe we are from a different planet. Maybe we don't understand the depths of these watches. And maybe it is not for us to understand. We should just look at them and say, well, to each their own. This next one is important. The contribution that Richard Mille has had on the gray market. The prices of these watches on the gray market is just, it's difficult to explain in a few words. There is a counter argument to this, but everything that I've listed earlier lines up with this point too. People want what they can't have. They are seeing it everywhere. They feel a need to own a watch like this. They are willing to go out of their way to get them. And this creates a strange atmosphere in itself. One that we are now finding is happening virtually everywhere. We see how the luxury watch is perceived how the prices of so many in-demand models keep on skyrocketing without an end in sight. So I do believe that in the way that Richard Mille has established itself as this higher tier brand, the manufacturer of for the 1%, so many of the other recognizable names are going after the same approach, limiting their supply to increase the demand, make their watches feel a lot more prestigious than they actually are. And here we're talking about authorized dealers. Once we move to the gray market, that increases tenfold. And many bank on that desperation, that urge, desire to own that thing. Before reaching the last bullet point, this line that I've just put in about common sense, holistically, we can appreciate something. In fact, it's a designer's job to do such a thing. It's to think more deeply about whatever the product is. The same in art and other forms of creation. Art can be interpreted differently by everyone. And I think the same thing goes with watches and our specific tastes. But there comes a time when common sense needs to step in. When you're paying six figures for something that is made of high tensile plastics, forged components, sapphire crystals, common metals, a few bright spot colors on a rubber or a nylon strap, with a Velcro clasp, you've got to sit back and scratch your head for a little while. When we think of the word luxury watch, we think of the word substance very often. We like heft, weight. Materiality does play into this. The high performance hyper watch that this piece is doesn't weigh anything and is often criticized as being a toy watch because you can barely feel it on your wrist. When we talk about the tactility of it, many do say it doesn't feel like a luxury product. The common description that is assigned, this is generalizing, to people who have these watches, it's that they have more money than sense. We can't be critical of these people and their choices to each their own, but common sense needs to step in. And I think deep down when people look beyond the image of the watch and how it is seen amongst your friend group and others, is it really worth it? And to close off this chapter on Richard Meal, the big question that is often thrown around is, is it a fad watch? Is it one that is going to fade into obscurity in the coming years? This has happened to many manufacturers in the past, and we could be sitting at a point now where these are in demand, where people are interested in them, but will they stand the test of time? And it is an interesting question because it plays on the futurism. It plays on the forward thinking and the use of technology that we are now seeing in so many other high performance products. This is not something that's going to change anytime soon. The fact that these watches still use mechanics, mechanical components, actual watchmaking principles means that they do have a horological significance. As much as we like to bash the watch for its aesthetics, there is some relevance here. The aesthetics of the watch and how they will age is also very difficult to pinpoint. Bright accent colors are commonly assigned to certain time periods. They're never ones to last the centuries. The simpler designs are always the ones that are the most effective. Regardless of what happens to the products, Richard Mille, the brand, will be fine. They've made their money. If we're looking to the gray market and those who are buying these pieces with the investment potential, put that in quotations in mind, all of those little buzzwords we love so much, they are the ones who might struggle. But it's that whole premise of when you're buying something with different intentions in mind, when you're buying something not for the love of it, but for what it represents more than anything else, it's never going to be something with staying power. And while I can get behind the strategy and the identity of these pieces and how they are so well represented as these pieces of technological forward thinking, I cannot believe that these designs will last the test of time. And that's in 50 to 70 years time when you're sitting out on your porch, admiring the sunset, you're not going to be wearing a Richard Mille on your wrist. 
At least I don't believe so. That's not the image that comes to mind first. Like they say, any press is good press. And Richard Mille, it's a fascinating discussion, thinking about what this brand has been able to do, how it has positioned itself and how it is perceived by the rest of the industry, as well as us who are the enthusiasts. Is it a brand that makes sense? It does, in a way. Is it a design that we would go crazy for? Sell all our organs to own? No, probably not. Is it one that has seen resounding success? It sure has. And will it be one that will surpass the iconic names in our industry and last the test of time? No idea. And that's in 50 or 70 years time when you're sitting out on your porch overlooking the sunset, you're wearing a Richard meal on your wrist before you peg. At least I don't believe so. That's not the image. <laughs> oh, God. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I've been really struggling to keep a straight face, especially with the grandpa analogy. <laughs>